Hello. Mm -hmm. In this video, we're going to do a recap of the main notions uh, concerning uh, neural networks. And we're also going to introduce a couple of concepts that we didn't discuss last week. Okay. Remember that neural networks are comprised by units that are loosely modeled after biological neurons. These units are connected to other units. And these connections can be weaker or stronger, positive or negative. The strength and sign of the connection between a pair of units is expressed as a real number, and it is called the weight of the connection. Each of the units also has what is called an activation value, which can be represented either as a state with two values, on, off, firing or at rest, or as a state that can take continuous values. 0, 0.00001.25, etc. You can think of these units as little devices that perform very simple computations. What they do is combine the inputs from the units that lead to them by means of a weighted sum. This means that each of the neurons feeding into our unit contributes its activation value at the time, and that this value is multiplied by the weight of its connection, so that the greater the weight, the greater the influence of this contributing unit. For instance, suppose that each of the input units, whose bodies are not shown here, but only their connections, has an activation level of 1, but that the connection with unit D has a weight of 2, the connection with E has a weight of 0.25, and the connection with F a weight of minus 1. Then the contribution of D is going to be proportionally bigger than that of E, and in the opposite direction to that of F. Last, all of these products are added, and the result is the total input received by a unit neuron at a given stage. This is all compactly expressed in this equation, where wi is the given weight of the connection of the unit with the given input i. Remember that the weight for unit d was 2, the weight for unit e was 0.25, and the weight for f was minus 1. ai is the activation value for a given input i, which in this case was 1 for each input. WI times AI is a product of WI and AI, that is, the weighted value of a given input I. And this indicates that we sum all of the individual weighted values, where N is the total number of inputs. In our case, since we have three inputs, N equals three. And so the previous expression is short for this. We're not done yet. In the kind of model we are reviewing, the activation level for the unit is arrived at by applying the activation function to the weighted sum of the inputs. We saw that there were different kinds of activation functions. One of them, associated with Rosenblatt's perceptrons, is the binary threshold function, which says that if the weighted sum, or net input, to the unit is larger than a given threshold, then the activation, or output, if this is a single layer perceptron, is 1, and otherwise it is 0. So, if we assume that the threshold is 1, then the output, in the form of the activation value of this unit, is 1. Last week we mentioned the term bias, but we did not say much about it. A bias is a term that is added to the weighted sum, to make certain learning problems easier. In this particular case, I'm going to make the bias the negative of the threshold, which is minus 1. This will allow us to get rid of the threshold. Here's another update to our notation from last week. I'm going to use the letter W to abbreviate the list of all the weights of the connections that go into our unit. In other words, the array W will represent all the weights WI, from W1 to WN. Likewise, the letter A will represent the array of all activation values, A1 through AN. Again, here we're using the dot product notation, as is common in the literature. So, A dot W abbreviates the representation of the weighted sum of the inputs. Here you can see the longer form below, but we're going to take them as equivalent. And as you can see, the version at the top is shorter and less cluttered. So here we arrive at the equation that is most frequently used for perceptrons. And it is indeed the most fundamental rule governing the behavior of neural networks, the equation for the weighted sum of the artificial neuron. So if you're going to remember anything from this video, please remember this. Just to keep track of things, we're going to call z the result of doing this weighted sum. Another bit of terminology. The weights and the biases, 
as well as the thresholds in more traditional perceptrons, are called the parameters of the model because they are the variables whose values are adjusted so as to allow the network to learn the task. In other words, when a neural network learns, what it does is that it gradually modifies its ways until the desired result is achieved. By way of parenthesis, some of you might have recognized here the general form of a linear equation, so that w is the slope and b is the intercept. So sometimes you'll find it written as the expression in the bottom. One of the main characteristics of this function, of this binary threshold function, is the presence of this abrupt transition between 0 and 1. This sudden jerk is not good for training. If you remember the neural network's learning video, we train a network by making slight adjustments to the parameters, depending on whether the adjustment seems likely to improve the network's output. However, with this activation rule, the majority of slight adjustments to the weights will make no difference to the output. So the learning algorithm has little to work on, or too much, as in the case of the transition from 0 to 1. That's why there are other activation rules besides binary threshold. The traditional alternative is the sigmoid activation function, which, given its S shape, provides a gentle curve from 0 to 1, where an output may be any number from 0 to 1. One rule that we didn't mention last week, and which is at present very popular, is ReLU, or rectified linear unit. It says that if z, that is the weighted sum, is zero or negative, then a, that is the activation, is zero. But if z is zero or positive, then a is equal to z. Briefly then, a is going to be the larger number in the pair comprised by zero and z. If you remember, z was 1.75, which is larger than zero. Therefore, the activation is equal to z, and thus equal to 1.75. Like the sigmoid rule, ReLU is a nonlinear function, though it is a combination of two different linear rules, one that returns zero for all non-positive values, and one that returns the same number for all positive values. The nonlinear aspect is very important, since it is what gives deep learning networks their representing power. Linear rules, by the way, are not very powerful. So sigmoid and ReLU are not the only activation rules available for neural networks but they are among the most common. ReLU in particular is one of the most widely used activation rules in the hidden layers of deep artificial neural networks. <music> units are organized in layers comprised by one or more units. Depending on their location, they may be input layers, which as the name implies, encode the input to the network. Then you have output layers, which represent the outputs, and hidden layers where the intervening processing occurs. Some networks, such as early perceptrons, don't contain any hidden layers. The number of hidden layers is sometimes referred to as the depth of the network. A network like this, with only one hidden layer, is a shallow network. This one, with three hidden layers, is deeper. And with this one, we're getting into deep territory, but not too deep. Just to give you a reference, OpenAI's GPT-3, which is used for generating human-like text, has 96 layers. Units in one layer have connections to those in the succeeding layer. In the standard network, every unit in one layer is connected to every unit in the following layer. Such a network is considered a fully connected one. Also, processing in the form of activation spreading goes forward from input to output, thus a standard network is a feed-forward network. This is in contrast with recurrent networks, where previous outputs can be used as inputs for hidden layers. But the most common structure of an artificial neural network is that of a fully connected multi-layer network. In the typical artificial neural network, an input is presented and activation proceeds forward in accordance to weighted sum and activation rule formulas from one layer to the next, ending with the output. One of the most important features of neural networks, perhaps their main feature, is that they are able to learn from experience, that is, from exposure to data. In neural networks, learning proceeds by adjusting the network's various parameters, which, if you remember, are its weights, 
and biases or thresholds, depending on the case. There are three main different learning paradigms for neural networks, and this classification is valid for machine learning in general. There are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning employs what we could call a teaching signal, which tells the network whether its outputs are right or wrong, and if they are wrong, how wrong they are, and in which direction. And on the basis of this error signal, the different weights are modified to the appropriate extent and in the appropriate direction. In a typical supervised learning situation, we start with a set of label data. For instance, it might consist of pictures of animals paired with labels indicating the category to which they belong. Then, in our example, the machine must learn the output for the right category when presented with a picture. So at the beginning, the machine is presented with a picture detached from the label, and then the machine hazards a guess. Then the teacher compares the answer with the label associated with the picture and delivers its error signal. In unsupervised learning, the machine doesn't have this guidance. So for instance, the machine could be presented with a bunch of unlabeled images so that there is no predetermined right answer. The task might be then to find useful patterns inherent in the data or to reduce the complexity in the data set. So a network might group the data into these two categories, which you might interpret as animal-related versus machine-related, or as fuzzy versus non-fuzzy. Or it might divide them into these two groups, say, things with ears and things without ears. On different days, the machine might settle into different patterns. Again, there is no expected right answer, and you can say goodbye to that nasty teacher. An example of unsupervised learning is the autoencoder network, which is described in your textbook and whose job is to find a compressed or compact representation of the data. Another type of learning that doesn't quite fall into either of the previous categories is reinforcement learning. It is somewhat similar to the notion of learning by reinforcement that we encountered when we discussed Skinner's operand conditioning. Of course, here we are dealing with machines, called agents in the specialized literature, not with rats, pigeons, or dogs. In this modality, the agent has to learn which of its actions are associated with the greatest cumulative reward. One difference between reinforcement learning and the previous two is that in reinforcement learning, the decisions made by the learner influence the information that the environment provides to the agent. Depending on which actions the machine takes, it gets exposed to different kinds of feedback. In contrast, in supervised or unsupervised learning, the network never affects the data. It simply consumes it, so to speak. Reinforcement learning got a lot of press coverage in 2016 when it was used to train a machine to beat a human champion at the complex game of Go, something that some thought wouldn't be possible for a computer to do. Let's talk about supervised learning in neural networks. Suppose that our goal is to make our network into a cube detector so that it will output 1 whenever it's presented with a cube and 2 whenever its input is not a cube. So we start our training by initializing the weights with random values. Remember that, since this is a case of supervised learning, our data set will consist of labeled pictures, such as these. Now, for the machine to interact with the inputs, the stimuli must first have to be coded in terms of numbers, or patterns of activations on the network. We're going to have three input units in our input layer, so we need three numbers. So let's assume that we are encoding these two kinds of objects with these two sequences. Then we start presenting the inputs. Suppose that our first stimulus is a pyramid. Then the network does some processing on the basis of its input and the random weights. In its case, it wrongly predicts that it is a cube, since its output unit number one lights up. The teacher compares the network's output with the actual input label, and an error signal is generated. On the basis of this error signal, the weights leading to the outputs are modified, depending on how and how much they contributed to the output. This is usually done by an optimization algorithm called gradient descent which you learned about last week, and whose main goal is to reduce the error produced by the network's outputs. Then, the relevant weights in the previous layers are modified by means of an algorithm called backpropagation, which is one of the main techniques for modifying networks with hidden layers, and so on until we reach the first hidden layer. Then we repeat this procedure with all the members of the dataset, or with the subset that we're working with. Notice that processing and learning proceed in opposite directions, one forward, the other backward. Once we pass through our data set, we have gone through one epoch. Then we continue training and the weights keep on changing for several epochs until the network converges, which means that the weights have stopped changing in any significant way, which in its turn means that the machine ran out of ways to reduce the error. As a consequence, the network has achieved a stable state and the task hopefully has been learned.
One thing that bears repeating is that neural networks can be seen as computers, but with special characteristics. In fact, it can be proven that a multi-layer feedforward network can approximate any computable function, so they are universal approximators. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that the network will be able to learn the function in any straightforward way, but that's another issue. What neural networks do, as computers, is to map input vectors onto output vectors. That is, once they have learned the relevant function, they will systematically pair input vectors with their corresponding output vectors. For our present purposes, we can simply think of vectors as lists of numbers. This may not sound very exciting, but as we have said before, it is very powerful, since those numbers can represent many things. Moreover, we also saw that neural networks were parallel computers, as opposed to most commercially available computers, which are serial. This is because all of the units in a layer are working at the same time. In this respect, neural networks emulate the brain, which also features parallel processing. We also mentioned that neural networks often exhibit distributed representation, though some have localized encoding. In a localized representation scheme, each concept is represented by one unit, and each unit represents only one concept, so there is a one-to-one -one mapping between units and things being represented. So in this four-unit layer, unit 2 is exclusively devoted to representing dogs. Thus, unit 2 is activated whenever a picture of a dog is shown, and only when a dog is shown. Likewise, there is a cat unit, a fish unit, and a chair unit. In contrast, in a distributed representational scheme, each concept is represented by more than one unit, and each unit participates in the representation of more than one concept. So, representation is a team effort, so to speak. For instance, the concept dog is not represented by the value of any single unit, but by a particular pattern of values across all the units, like the one shown here. Likewise, the concept of cat may be encoded by another pattern of values. The same goes for fish and for chair. All the units participate in the representation of all concepts. What changes is the value that each of the units takes. If you inspect the units, you might discover that certain features are being represented. So it may be that the first unit encodes for mammalness, and the second one for friendliness, and the third unit for usefulness, and the fourth one for animacy. And so the objects are represented according to how they score in these features. Quite often, however, what you have is a number spaghetti situation that doesn't make any intuitive sense, which is therefore opaque to the human user. This is why artificial neural networks often end up being black boxes. We know that given some input, they yield some output, but it's hard to know exactly how to make sense of the intervening steps. Finally, we also noted that the style of computation displayed by neural networks is sometimes referred to as subsymbolic. This is in contrast with classical systems, of course, which are symbolic. One way of making the distinction is by saying that in symbolic systems, the tokens that are the subject of computational operations are symbols that can have a semantic interpretation, whereas this is not necessarily the case in neural networks. For example, suppose that we are using Newell and Simon's GPS, that is, General Problem Solver, to work through the missionaries and cannibals puzzle. This puzzle, if you remember, we have uh, three missionaries and three cannibals that all of them need to cross a river. And they have to do it with a boat, which only holds two people, with the constraint that if at any time the cannibals outnumber the missionaries, the missionaries in question will become dinner. So the task is to get the six people across the river intact. Then you might write this kind of code for the GPS. This represents the fact that initially the left bank contains three missionaries, three cannibals, and a boat, and the right bank is empty. And the goal is to get everybody to the right bank. Then the words inside the parentheses are arguments, and at runtime the computer will replace the symbols with other symbols, in accordance with certain operations. So you can see that the expressions in the code are both tokens of computation and interpretable symbols. At least for the human reading the code, if not for the computer, since you could replace throughout the word cannibal with your debit card PIN number, and the program would run in exactly the same way. In neural networks, the things that are subject to computational manipulation, for instance, the arguments and values of the input and activation functions, are properties of units such as weights, activation values, and biases. 
which by themselves do not necessarily have any clear semantic interpretation, though combinations of them might have. The computations here, then, occur below the symbolic, semantically interpretable level. Okay, so we have reviewed a series of notions concerning neural networks. We have the notion of a unit, and we saw its properties such as activation and weight. We saw the notion of bias, and the notion of a input, input function, in particular the weighted sum of inputs, and the uh, form um, A times W plus B. We also reviewed the notion of an activation function, and we went through three examples, such as the binary threshold, the sigmoid, and the most widely used these days, which is ReLU. The notion of layers with the input, output, and hidden layers, the notion of the depth of a layer, and a fit-forward processing. We also have the notion of supervised learning, and by gradient descent and pro backpropagation, and then a characterization of neural networks as computer, which are parallel, tend to have distributed representation, and exhibit subsymbolic computation. Thank you.